I'm dumbfounded right now. The stuff that you find out in the field. First off, this thing is covered in cork tape. I hate cork tape. It's the bane of my existence. But does anybody see anything wrong with that picture right there? Maybe like the TXV sensing bulb is on the outlet of the TXV. That's not gonna work that way. This morning we are starting on a reach-in cooler. They're complaining that the cold rail up top is not working. So when I got here, what I found is that um, this switch right here, which controls the cold rail, is shut off. If I open this up, this is ice cold. And they're saying the bottom is working flawlessly. So I doubt that it's just a switch, but I turn that on. Condensed unit's not running and now it's starting. So the next thing we're gonna do is go ahead and put on service gauges on this guy and then uh, see what's going on with the pressures. I'm very familiar with how these units work and um, if there's like a hissing noise coming up here, you can hear the expansion valve feeding it almost sounds like it's low on charge. It sounds like it's feeding vapor. Like there's vapor going to the valve. I don't know, we'll see. I could be going crazy, but um, I'm just kind of sliding this condensing unit out right now. And what was strange was the condensing unit just shut off. Now I don't have, serv there it goes, it just shut off again. I do not have service gauges on this guy. So we're gonna put the gauges on and figure out what's going on, but it sounds like it's short cycling on low pressure at the moment. All right, I've got the field piece job link probes on and um, we're looking at the job link app and we are definitely shutting off on low pressure. So 20 PSI on the suction line and dropping and the low pressure control is cutting it out. So what we need to figure out is, is the system still calling? Is the solenoid valve, the solenoid valve's open. Feels like it at least. We'll check it, we'll check to see if the solenoid valve's calling because that solenoid valve is controlled by this control right here. And if it's getting voltage, then the only thing in between here is a power head uh, for the expansion valve. And we could have a power head failure. What I'm curious about though, is how the unit operates with just the bottom running. So we're gonna go ahead and open up the drawer and turn it on. Um, it, I mean, I wouldn't think that it's that low on charge because the bottom's cold, but we still wanna see the bottom turn on. So I open that up so it can warm up. We'll open these drawers so it can all warm up and then we'll get the bottom to start calling and then see if it still runs with the bottom on. In a screwdriver, what you can do sometimes is just put it right on there and you can actually feel that solenoid coil is calling. There's a, it's magnetic and I can feel the buzzing of the valve. So the valve is calling, but I haven't checked voltage yet, but it's there, you can feel it. It's not shut. So either we have a bad power head or something else is going on here, but likely it's gonna be a power head. I'm dumbfounded right now. The stuff that you find out in the field. First off, this thing is covered in cork tape. I hate cork tape vein of my existence, but does anybody see anything wrong with that picture right there? Maybe like the TXV sensing bulb is on the outlet of the TXV. That's not going to work that way. What I don't understand is the previous technician that worked at this place, it wasn't me, it wasn't my company, but what are they thinking? Like they took the sensing bulb off of the outlet of the cold rail all the way back there, but then they didn't think when they put the sensing bulb on the outlet of the TXV, like, hey, this isn't where I took it off. What are we thinking here? The incompetence these days is ridiculous. And uh, I turned off the top section, turned on just the bottom and got it to turn on, and we are running extremely low pressure. So this guy actually looks like it's low on charge. It's not short cycling with just the bottom running, but I think it's that weird in between. So we've got refrigerant leaks somewhere. Uh, that TXV, I don't like it. The sensing bulb, I don't like it, but I don't think that is our problem. I believe we're completely low on charge. So we're going to pull the food out of this guy and then get in there. Uh, it only has one evaporator coil. We're gonna leak search that. These units are kind of a pain 
to come out, but you gotta take all kinds of stuff apart, uh, and your hands are gonna smell like prep table funk for the next week, unless you wear gloves, or I'm too lazy to go get gloves, so I'm kinda stuck with the smell, but pull these guys out. The, the construction of these boxes makes it almost impossible to get back in here and clear clean because if you let them take all the screws out and stuff, this thing would never go back together right. This is dinner time. Look at that. Looks nice and yummy. Ooh. Looks like we got some extra stuff going on in that drain pan. Man, sometimes these boxes are amazing. Uh, how... I'm impressed. They actually got a spatula to stick to the top of the box. That's very impressive. Someone get some brownie points for that, man. I wonder what that is. Is that mayonnaise? Garlic aioli? So I love using the job link probes, but one of the downsides to the job link probes with not using a traditional manifold is that I want to equalize out my pressures, right? Because my low side has, a, has pressure because the solenoid valves is sitting at 20 PSI. And because the solenoid valves are closed, it's not equalizing out, right? If I had a manifold gauge that I could just open the high and low side valves and it would equalize. But there's another way we can do this. There's a reason why I keep access fittings on both. So I'll just put a hose between the two, let the pressures equalize out. Then while I'm doing that, I'll uh, take that cover off and then we'll do a leak search on the system. So this is my charging hose that goes in my smart probe bag for my job link probes. Um, when I put it on that side, I leave it cracked, so it's slightly hissing out, so that way we're constantly purging and we're not introducing any air into the system. And then we just screw it onto here, and then our pressures will be equal. All right, now we're equalizing out. You can see we're at 71, 72. I have the power switch shut off, so the compressor's not gonna turn on. And then I'm gonna work on getting that cover off, and then we'll do a leak search on that evaporator coil. All right, so leak detector's over here. It was already picking something up a second ago. Let's see what we got. Yeah, it's already getting in there. I really like that lighted tip because it really tells you a lot. Get in here, make sure, oh yeah, look at that. This thing's just going crazy. Now I have it on turbo mode so we can adjust the sensitivity down to just low, right? And then we can really get in here and it's even picking it up on low, but that lighted tip on this leak detector really makes all the difference. I really dig that. Oh yeah, that coil. Is done now there's nothing on that coil that I'm gonna try to fix if it has leaks they're getting a whole new coil no ifs ands or buts about it it's too much of a pain in the butt um, so what I'll do is I'll put the coil back together um, I'm not even gonna try to get in there with soap bubbles because it really doesn't matter to me that thing is done just judging by the look of it and then uh, we'll quote a new evaporator coil complete assembly not just the coil but the complete assembly with fan motors we'll quote um, We'll fix that sensing bulb. Actually, I'll probably fix that right now. I'll top off the charge and we'll get a new dryer on this guy. And you always gotta pay attention to the condensate heater. It actually doesn't look bad, but I'm gonna check that hot gas condensate heater too because those do have a tendency to leak. All right, I'm gonna get ready to start it up. Um, but what we need to do is when we are putting our hose on there, we need to leave it the ball valve cracked just a little bit so we're purging, right? Because that's connected to that right there. So we close it off. Now we've ensured we introduce no air or non-condensables into the system. Again, it's all about taking the time to do it right to prevent headaches. I actually forgot I still needed to mount that sensing bolt back there. So now I've got it mounted on the outlet. I still need to secure it with one more strap, but I got one in there. And then we're gonna get some uh, foam tape wrapped around it nice and tight. So. You can't always assume because something is where it is that that's the right place. We still got to put our thinking caps on and think, 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 right? Um, but uh, yeah, so now I'll put my hose back on and, and get ready to start it up once I get it insulated. All right, so we need an ambient temperature. It's about 65. Our uh, uh, condensing temp over ambient is going to be about 25 to 30 degrees over ambient. So. 65, 75, 85, 95 degree condensing temp is what we're aiming for. We're just gonna add a little refrigerant slowly and uh, see if we can get this guy to run properly. Um, I am using a rule of thumb to charge this unit because we're not gonna weigh in the charge when we have a known refrigerant leak, right? We're not gonna recover the charge and then start over. I'm just using a rule of thumb to get us going temporarily and then we're gonna warn the customer. 
but we're right about, we're a little bit over, but we should be fine. Um, we're gonna let the unit operate, then we'll turn on the top, make sure the top operates fine, and uh, we'll go from there. Another thing I should clarify too, is that I was using, I was letting the system run and I was charging it with just the bottom calling, not the top. Because the top has a static evaporator, there's no fan motors, it's gonna lower the TD of the system, the evaporator TD, which is gonna affect the way that you charge it. So whenever you're charging these units that have static cold rails, I find it easiest to charge with just the bottom running. And so, and then give it some time because um, it'll really affect your refrigerant pressure. So I always do it with just the, the bottom running. I just turned on the top just to make sure. And we're gonna watch the top frost up and make sure it works right. Um, and while I'm doing that, I'm just kind of looking around, looking to see if there's anything else I need to consider replacing. I'm not seeing anything. Sometimes these temperature controllers will have water damage on the top. I don't see that. Everything else is looking pretty darn good right now. This thing's running. It's taking a while. It's going to take a while to come down to temp, but it's starting to get a little cold and frosty in the cold rail. So that's a good sign. You can see the frost up in the top. It should be pretty even all the way across. That little white strip right there is the frost. Um, refrigerant pressures, I have the bottom turned off because the bottom was satisfied, but the bottom's currently at 40 degrees, but I just turned the control off. Now it's just the top that's running. Looking pretty good. I'm not seeing any issues. So at this point, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and give them a quote for a dryer evaporator coil. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'll give this a little brush real quick and get it pushed back together and uh, give them the keys. We are back today. We're gonna go ahead and uh, replace this evaporator coil. It was approved. So we're getting the drawers pulled apart. There's no, uh, no spatula stuck to the top on this one. And uh, we're gonna open this guy up. Uh, got the recovery machine right here. We're gonna get that all ready and running real quick. Currently getting the coil disconnected and opened up. The drawers are all out. Got the recovery machine hooked up. Um, we had left the unit running while we were taking the drawers out. So yeah, the refrigerant pressures were pretty equalized. They were running. Not that it really matters because we're gonna be pulling from both sides anyways. Um, we're all set up. The first thing we're gonna do is I leave this loose right here. And then we're gonna go ahead and open this and open this. That way we can purge to right here. There we go. We're purged. We're not gonna reuse the refrigerant, but we're still treating it as if we are. This tank is nowhere near being full, um, but uh, normally you'd put a scale under it, uh, but this thing only has a pound or two pounds of gas or something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up both sides on the S-Man manifold here. Love the large display. This is the S-Man 480B. Um, large opening, everything's ready. Uh, everything's hooked up, open to here. So we're just gonna hit start on the MR45 recovery machine and it's got the slow ramp up. There we go. So we're gonna let it go ahead and pull down. It's not gonna take long at all. And then we'll get in here and start changing everything out. Now, um, the recovery machine has the auto shut off, auto shut off at negative 10. If you hit start again, it'll run longer into a vacuum to satisfy EPA requirements. But the system also has a refrigerant leak in that evaporator coil. So if we run it too much longer, it's just gonna be pulling air. Not that I'm gonna reuse the refrigerant, but still, we don't wanna mix it unnecessarily. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and turn it to the self purge and it's gonna try to get out as much of the refrigerant out of the machine as it can. Uh, it will auto shut off again, and then uh, we'll be done with the recovery. We just about got the coil disassembled. Should not be a hard replacement at all. The old coil pulled out, got the lines cut long. We'll figure out the electrical in a minute. We're swaged right here. Uh, I didn't really wanna unsweat on the TXV, so swage these two, we'll cut the other ones to fit, and just working our way through it. All right, we're assembling the coil in there. Um, right here, we're getting ready. I got the S-Man manifold right here. We are gonna pull our evacuation through the manifold. I've got my large diameter 3 8 hose run to the vacuum pump. Now, of course, it's not ideal. I've got the gas ballast open. It's got the slow ramp up on the VPX7. This pump is way overkill, but it's just what I carry in my truck. This is the lightest pump that Field Peace has, so it works great and I have it when I need it. But for something like this, I'm only pulling at like one CFM at that because I left the Schraders in. Um, we're pulling through hoses and pulling through a manifold. So those Schraders are a massive restriction in the system. But at the same time, understand, on a system this small with quarter inch lines and stuff, 
you've got a natural restriction in the system. So yes, the Schrader's taking them out will make it go faster, but it's also difficult on little guys like this. So for now, this manifold is gonna be perfect. I'm pulling the initial pull down. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the uh, vacuum port right now. There we go. And then we'll open up the high and the low side. You can hear it start to pull into a vacuum. Now this does have a built-in micron gauge and the S-Man manifold. So we're gonna let this run for a bit, make sure everything's nice and tight. Once we get a deep uh, deep enough vacuum, I'll shut the gas ballast, but I'm gonna look for like 1,500 microns, 1,000 microns, and then that's when I'll shut it. Now at 800 microns, now understanding that it's not a true 800 microns since we're using the manifold's micron gauge, this is getting more of a pull than the actual system. So we're probably in the 1500 micron range inside the system. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and close the gas ballast and uh, go ahead and let this guy just continue to pull down with the gas ballast closed. Now you can tell when the gas ballast is open and closed because of the LED light in there. So the gas ballast is open, now the gas ballast is closed and it's controlled via this little paddle right here. So now we're just gonna let this thing run for a bit. We're assembling the box. Uh, we had it, went ahead and put on a Sporling catch-all dryer. I love these little guys, the O32 Cap T dryer. Quarter inch ports and it already has a process stub on the dryer and it comes with a Schrader. So I dig those O32 Cap Ts, use those a lot. Um, coils there, we're just assembling it again. And uh, yeah, that's where we're going. A tip is um, if you can, and understanding how the system works, energize the system so all the solenoid valves open up. In this situation, um, We've got the coil in, we energized it so we can see the evaporative fan motors working to make sure we did our job right. And then back here, uh, there's no uh, refrigerant left in the system and we do have a low pressure control back there. So the compressor is not gonna turn on. So we energized it, all the solenoid valves are now on and open and uh, the evacuation is just a little bit easier that way because they've got flow both ways. So again, we're just letting this run for a bit. All right, um, I just uh, shut it off a few minutes ago. We're in a decay right now. It's slowly rising, but I don't see any problems. We pulled it down to about 600 microns. It wasn't gonna get too much better than that. But uh, yeah, this thing seems fine. So the thing to understand, since we're pulling through Schraders and stuff, you know, when we close this right here, right, this is our vacuum port, we leave these ones open so that way we can still see it rise because inevitably it is gonna rise. That happens. So you just gotta let it sit for a while. You know, best practices is to have a micron gauge furthest away from the pump, but in this situation, since we're pulling through the manifold, it kinda is what it is. So um, I'm pretty comfortable with that vacuum rate, so we're gonna get the scale out and get ready to charge this guy. We've got this guy purged. Uh, we've got it connected to the manifold right there. So we need to zero it out because we've already purged it all the way to here, okay? So we zero it out. All right, and we're looking for two pounds, 32 ounces. So we're gonna go ahead and open this process port and we will lose our micron reading, that's normal, okay? And then uh, we'll go ahead and open up the, well, we gotta shut the system off and then open up the high side. We're putting as much gas into the high side as we can. Again, we're looking for two pounds. We're just gonna let it dump into the high side. And then uh, once it stops taking it on the high side, we'll turn the system on and charge it in on the low side. All right, we were able to put one pound of gas in through the high side, again, with the system off. Now I closed my process, I mean my high and my low. Process is still open. We're gonna go ahead and turn the system on. The top's gonna turn on. Uh, solenoid valve's gonna open. It's gonna take a minute because we have digital controls and stuff. So once it starts up, it's, opening, it's getting ready to turn on and it's waiting for the low pressure control to see enough pressure, that way it turns it on. So I'll tell you when it turns on, should be around 55. Oh, maybe not 55, this is a pump down circuit. Um, so uh, we're gonna add it on the low side and we're just watching it, we're looking for two pounds. We're just adding refrigerant slowly on the low side. Now, yes, we do have this opened and stuff. Um, we're just doing this just to get it charged and then we're gonna do a leak search and then we'll close all this up. All right, got the field piece DR82 in here. Looking at our braze joints, luckily we can get right to them to make sure there's no leaks. Nope, all right, and then we're gonna come right on over here. Leak check the dryer, our two braze joints on the dryer, nothing. 
and we would know because you have the lighted tip on this one and the display so yeah we're good no leaks we're gonna finish putting this guy together and watch it come down to 10. this guy is running it's coming down in temperature it's gonna take a little while um, it's about 60 degrees in this kitchen right now so it's pretty cool um, we're just pushing everything back we've got the drawers back together uh, that's pretty much it we're gonna take our gauges off and uh, wrap this one up you know it can be just a reach in cooler call and you you still can be surprised just working on a reach-in cooler. You think it's the easiest thing. It's just a reach-in. How hard can it be? But, you know, like this is the stuff you run into. You have to learn how to deconstruct what other people have done, try to make sense of what they're trying to do with that TXV sensing bulb. Like, what was that person thinking? Honestly, I genuinely think it was pure laziness and ignorance, but because they unstrapped that sensing bulb, more than likely someone changed a power head like because the power head more than likely had failed and they changed just the power head but in and they unstrapped it from the outlet of the cold rail and strapped it to the outlet of the txv so that took effort on their part like they took the straps off of the outlet of the cold rail and added the straps to the outlet of the txv like they had to think right or maybe they didn't i don't know i i'm dumbfounded on the stuff that i come across but other than that, I mean, this is just a basic repair. You have to know your limits. You know, of course, I want to pull a perfect vacuum all the time. And of course, I want to, you know, um, uh, weigh the charge in every single time. But you come up to a system that has a leak and it's like this thing has like a pound of gas. I'm not going to recover the charge. I couldn't fix it that day and they needed it. So I was going to top it off. So I just used some rules of thumbs, got it to about 30 degrees. Uh, the condensing temp was 30 degrees over ambient ish. And, you know, that got me in the ballpark and got it running until I went back and made the permanent repair, changing the evaporator coil, filter dryer. Then I vacuumed the system down and weighed in the charge. OK, so it's always best practice to try to weigh it in. But sometimes you you, you got to do what you got to do right to get it operational. Same thing, you know, call the vacuum police on me, whatever. I don't always use my fancy big blue hoses and all that stuff. I try to as much as possible, but you also have to be practical. And I know that all the times that I've pulled those giant hoses out on these tiny systems, it just causes headaches. There's too many connections, too many places, too many tight angles. And I pretty much utilize those for walk-in repair and air conditioning repair. When I'm working on tiny reach-ins, I don't always use those big hoses, and I'll usually use my manifold gauge set. You just have to understand what's happening if you're using your manifold gauge set. Understand the limitations. Understand that if you leave the Schraders in, there's going to be a massive restriction, and it's going to take a lot longer to pull the evacuation. Understand that the micron gauge in the manifold gauge set is not ideal in a perfect world, it's installed at the furthest point away from the evacuation that you are getting a true reading in the system. So, but you know, as technicians, sometimes we have to, you know, deal with, you know, obstacles and sometimes we have to make things work and it is what it is, right? You know, we do our best and that's, that's all that we can do, right? I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of this video. As usual, it is amazing. If you guys haven't already, please check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. It's a great way to help support the channel. There's a whole bunch of other ways you can support the channel. Um, the easiest way is simply watching the videos from beginning to end, guys. There's show notes or links in the show notes to all the other methods, Patreon, PayPal, YouTube channel memberships, PayPal. I already said that. Um, yeah, that's it. I really appreciate you, and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?